This is CGTN, China Global Television Network. Egypt's President al-Sisi hosts Sudan's ruling TMC deputy Hamdan Dagalo. Controversy over a second vaccine threatens to derail the Ebola response in the DRC. And high-profile cancer deaths in Kenya raise the focus on the killer disease. Hello and a very warm welcome to Africa Live on CGTN. I'm Lindim Tongana in Nairobi. And with me is Penina Karibe with a preview of your business news. Thank you, Lindy. And coming up on Africa Live Business. Representatives from China and the U.S. meet in Shanghai for the first round of talks since May. And unemployment in South Africa rises to the highest level in 11 years. I'll be back with details of those stories and plenty more in just a bit. For now, it's back to you, Lindy. Thanks, Penina. Well, let's start the hour in the north of the continent where Egyptian President Abdel Fattah al-Sisi has hosted the deputy head of Sudan's Transitional Military Council, General Mohamed Hamden Dagalo, also known as Hameti. Al-Sisi discussed the political transition in Sudan and offered Cairo's assistance. The two also discussed the future of political talks and current mutual development projects between both nations. Here's Adel al Makhri with more. In the Egyptian Etahadeya presidential palace, General Mohamed Hamdan Diglou has found a warm welcome. A series of meetings with the Egyptian president, chief of intelligence and foreign minister have all confirmed Cairo's support for Sudan during its transitional period. President el-Sisi has discussed bilateral relations, electricity and railroad connectivity between the two nations. Egypt doesn't want the instability in Khartoum affect the much-needed common development projects. The military council is the executive authority now, and in the future, it's a partner in Sudan's leadership, based on the power-sharing agreement. Cairo understands that positive communication with it is essential for the future of both countries. Cairo wants to support the people of reason who want to complete this transition in the soonest and safest manner. Diglo's visit came ahead of another round of talks between the Freedom and Change Civilian Coalition and the Military Council. Tension has been increasing this week after at least five protesters have been killed in another violent clashes with security forces. There are attempts to disrupt the political dialogue in Sudan. Whenever there is a positive achievement, we notice that such violent incidences or coup attempts follow, which appears to be aimed at igniting division. Egypt has passed through similar transition like Sudan, and Cairo can provide its experience in reaching a safe passage through this fragile period. The Egyptian president has stressed the vitality of Sudan's stability to Egypt. El Sisi has also highlighted the importance to speed up the transition in order to reflect the free will of the Sudanese people. Before Duglu, the Egyptian president has also met with Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, the head of the Sudanese Military Transitional Council. Fearing foreign intervention in Sudanese politics, Cairo is trying to maintain strong relations with all parties there in hopes to achieve a peaceful political transition. Adel Mahroui, CGTN, Cairo. Meanwhile, Sudan's opposition alliance has cancelled talks scheduled for Tuesday with the Transitional Military Council. This comes as protest leaders visit a town in North Kordofan where rapid support forces allegedly killed school children at a rally against bread and fuel shortages. The Military Council condemned the killing of children in the town of Al Obaid. According to a negotiator for the protest movement, negotiations were called off since the team was still in the town. The Sudanese Professionals Association has now called for nationwide rallies in the wake of Monday's killings. The events escalated quickly. Some infiltrators intervened and created a state of chaos which resulted in looting of property owned by Khartoum Bank in El Obeid and an attempt to loot the French bank in El Obeid as well. This led to the fall of five martyrs. We ask God to bestow his mercy on them and to comfort their families and beloved ones. An investigation has been opened to look into the killings and the damage. 
Well, let's now head to the Democratic Republic of Congo, where plans to introduce a second Ebola vaccine are threatening to affect the response to the Ebola outbreak. It is one of the reasons why Health Minister Uli Ilunga resigned, saying the planned implementation of trials on the vaccine by Johnson & Johnson was not well thought out. Here's Daniel Arab Moy with the details on that controversy. The resignation of Oli Ilunga as DRC's health minister brought to the fore the push and pull in the response to an Ebola outbreak in nation. At the center of the controversy is the planned introduction of a new Ebola vaccine by Johnson & Johnson. Ilunga said the efficiency of the new vaccine has not been proven. He also felt that with the current mistrust from locals towards foreign medical teams, the introduction of another vaccine will raise more doubts from the communities. One of the big differences compared to the Ebola epidemic in the Equator province is firstly the high density of the population in the east and the high mobility of populations. The third important point is security. But proponents of the new vaccine say it will help in curbing the spread of the disease. Until now, there are local and foreign experts. And by foreign, I mean experts who came from Kinshasa and expatriates who are here and they don't speak the language. Now we want to put everything in the hands of the locals. Currently, an Ebola vaccine developed by American pharmaceutical firm Merck is in use in the DRC. Unlike Merck's, the Johnson & Johnson vaccine is dispensed in two doses, administered 56 days apart. But some locals in DRC feel that the citizens of the Great Lakes nations will be used as guinea pigs. We do not encourage the use of this second vaccine after the first one was approved by WHO. What we need to do is improve the first vaccine by working on its side effects. Personally, it worries me a lot. As a Congolese, I will not take that vaccine because it is not serious. If the WHO is bringing a second vaccine, is it because the first one did not work well enough? And where did that vaccine come from? The other problem is that this vaccine will be experimented for the first time on the Congolese people. GRC's health authorities say Johnson & Johnson was not single-sourced. At the moment, there are three possible vaccines which we can use. There was the Russian vaccine, the Chinese vaccine, and the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And the studies we carried out at our National Institute of Biomedical Research led us to the conclusion that the J&J &J vaccine was the one that presented us with the most data. Therefore, this vaccine was our choice. The Ebola outbreak in North Kivu has affected over 2,500 people. More than 1,700 have died so far. The recent declaration of the outbreak as a public health emergency of international concern by WHO has seen more focus put on fighting the spread of the disease. And with it, local and international interests from key players in the pharmaceutical sector seem to be taking center stage. Daniel Arab Moy, CGTN. Meanwhile, authorities in the Democratic Republic of Congo are searching for an Ebola patient who escaped from a treatment center in North Kivu province on Monday. The patient fled from an isolation ward where he was being treated for the deadly disease. CGTN's Chris Ochomringa has more from Kinshasa. The escape happened in the town of Lubero in North Kivu province. Authorities believe the patient has returned to the community. The incident has sparked fears the disease may spread more widely. According to the health ministry, the patient tested positive for Ebola on the 25th of July. A search is being conducted to prevent more infections. Last year, three Ebola patients escaped from an isolation center in Western DRC. Health officials had to search for them and then locate all the people they came into contact with to prevent the disease from spreading. The stigma associated with Ebola has led some families to hide their sick relatives at home. But Congolese officials and the international community have stepped up efforts to educate communities about the dangers of the disease. The World Health Organization declared the outbreak a public health emergency of international concern after Ebola spread to a major urban hub of Goma two weeks ago. 
Krista Chamringa, CGTN, Kinshasa, Democratic Republic of Congo. Well, staying with health-related issues, we come here to Kenya now, where cancer is firmly in focus, following the deaths of three high-profile personalities in the last four weeks. The country is reeling from the rising prevalence of cancer, as reports indicate that close to 50,000 new cases were recorded in 2018, while about 33,000 deaths were recorded in the same period. CGTN's Robert Nagila has that report. In the past month, the country has been rocked by the deaths of three high-profile personalities from cancer. Bob Collymore, the CEO of Kenya's most profitable company, Safaricom, Ken O'Kot, a member of parliament, and Joyce Laboso, a governor who passed away on Monday. The governor of the capital city says nearly 20% of the country's legislators suffer from cancer. Uh, the reports which we have now uh, there are over 60 MPs. According to the Global Cancer Observatory, 48,000 new cases of cancer were recorded in the country in 2018. About 19,000 cases were male, while close to 29,000 female. The number of deaths recorded from cancer in the same period stood at about 33,000. That's a staggering 98 deaths a day from cancer. Number one is breast cancer, uh, followed by cervical cancer, then prostate and esophagus. And we look at the top killing cancers, esophagus comes top, followed by cervical cancer. Ossophagal cancer is a type of cancer that affects the esophagus, the long tube that carries food from the throat to the stomach. It mainly affects people in their 60s and 70s and is more common in men than women. Despite the high figures, more people succumb to malaria and pneumonia than cancer. The causes are put down to a multiplication of factors such as genetics and lifestyle. Health experts say the trend can be reversed by providing quality health care. At the end of the day, if we beef up our oncology centers, we improve our hospitals, I think the solution for majority of Kenyans is still back home. Only very few are flying out of the country and maybe they can afford. But we need to look at the masses. How best can we do? From starting from the grassroots in terms of creating awareness. Simple things like avoid smoking, do exercise. Cancer screening is already free thanks to the introduction of universal health care. But a lot more still needs to be done in areas such as research and providing quality health care if current trends are to be reversed. Robert Nagela, CGTN, Nairobi, Kenya. Well, time now for a short break. Here's what's still ahead on the program. Coming up, Ethiopia plants over 350 million trees in a single day. And Tunisia's legislative elections to be held on October 9th. Africa Live. Find your voice. Well, let's start in the Democratic Republic of Congo, where a South African and a Zimbabwean working for a Canadian gold mining firm, Banro, have been kidnapped in the rest of eastern region. The incident took place in South Kivu, which shares a border with both Rwanda and Burundi. An army spokesman confirmed the incident and said the identity of the militia behind the kidnapping is not yet known. No one or no group has yet claimed responsibility. Well, let's bring you more on this now. We're joined by CGTN's Chris Ochumbringa. He's live with us from Kinshasa. Uh, Chris, at the moment, the information coming in is rather thin. What more can you tell us about these kidnappings? Well, the Congolese Army spokesperson says they're still hunting.
for these uh, armed men who took uh, four people hostage, the two, uh, two foreigners, a South African, a Zimbabwean, and two Congolese. They believe that these uh, armed men are uh, members of a militia known as Mai Mai who have been wreaking havoc in North Kivu and South Kivu province. And they're saying they will do everything possible to get back the hostages and also apprehend those armed men who have been causing trouble in uh, North Kivu province. Now, of course, we know there has been tension in that area, but just talk us through the history of kidnappings uh, in Kivu. Has there been, have there been several incidents? And if so, what is the cause? Yes, the, the situation in North Kivu is very bad. <clears throat> we have, we have uh, read the reports by what they call as the Ki Kivu Security Tracker. Uh, this is an institution that you know follows all incidents of abductions in the area, and they saying they're saying that from uh, 2018 there were more than 700 abductions in North Kivu province, and these are <clears throat> by carried out by criminal gangs and militia that operate in in uh, North Kivu and South Kivu province. It's a very big problem. What most security people are saying is that it is largely because of poverty and unemployment. Now there are many people, especially young people in that part of the, the DRC who have, have studied but they have no jobs. There are no industries in that area and the area is very remote. And so what people do is they, they take up arms so that they can fend for themselves. That's the only thing that they know. Uh, because that part of North Kivu province has, has very many mineral deposits, gold especially. And so that is where the concentration of most militias is found in the DRC. Because when these people have guns, then they control some of these mining sites and then they start making money from getting this thing illegally. And so it's a big problem in the DRC. There's a very weak government presence in that part of the DRC. And that has seen rebels from foreign countries, Rwanda, Uganda, operate in DRC territory. It's a problem that has, has been here for a very long time. But the new government hopes that they will change the way things are. And with 700 and, uh, abductions, it is a very serious problem indeed. Thank you so much, Chris Obchamringa, joining us there live from Kinshasa. Now, Ethiopia has made its mark in the record books by planting over 350 million trees in a single day. Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed spearheaded the project, which aims to counter the effects of deforestation and climate change in the drought-prone country. The UN says Ethiopia's forest coverage declined from 35% of total land in the early 20th century to just above 4% in the 2000s. Here's Gurum Chala with more. The name of the initiative, Green Legacy, the total number of seedlings planned for planting, 4 billion. And so far, Ethiopia has managed to plant more than 3 billion of them in less than six months' time. Within a day, a record 200 plus a million seedlings were planted across Ethiopia. Of that number, the suburbs take 3 million. So the initiative to plant for billion trees and especially 7.7 .7 million in Addis Ababa. And all over today, we're planning to plant 3 million. Of course, the turnout will be more than 3 million. And the initiative is to cope up with the current environment and so that we build a resilient economy, a resilient city, so that the resident of the city will have more fresh environment. The nationwide tree planting initiative was launched by Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed himself, creating awareness about the green development and motivate reforestation were some of his plans. Hundreds of millions of people responded across Ethiopia quickly and have joined the campaign. <laughs> As you have seen, the people came out driven by their own interests to plant seedlings. In the meantime, I would like to mention to you that we are committed to protect and water these seedlings and inspire you who will see them grow well. I'm here with my child who is less than two months old. We came to leave our green legacy by planting seedlings. It simply is a god sent initiative that we are happy to be part of. 
I would really like it if this day could be celebrated as an yearly seedling planting day or simply a green day. I would like in this regard to thank our Prime Minister for this idea. He is our green leader. With the plan of planting 4 billion trees going well, Ethiopia is well positioned to improve its current 4% forest coverage. Addis Ababa's mayor, Takala Uma, is even hopeful the campaign could be exemplary for the rest of the African continent. Hey, climate change is real. It's not a hoax. And the initiative is to make Ethiopia green again and Addis Ababa green again. And we will always remember that Addis Ababa by itself is a fresh floor, a new flower. And we, we need to make it again. And we need to make Addis to live up to that name and remember what started in Addis is inspired all over Africa. And remember that also Addis Ababa is a seat for Africa, African Union and African people are still residing here. And we are happy to have them too. Ethiopia might be grappling with all sorts of challenges from ethnic inflated chaos to political and economic instability. But with the kind of unity people are displaying across the country, experts tell you Ethiopia has a reason to hope for a brighter and stronger future so to come. Group Dara CGTN, Addis Ababa, Ethiopia. Let's head to Egypt now, where the Chinese embassy in Cairo has held celebrations to mark Chinese 92nd Army Day. Events were led by Chinese ambassador to Egypt, Liao Liqiang. The day is a celebration of the Chinese People's Liberation Army's 92 years of existence. The army has recently been involved in peacekeeping initiatives on the continent, where it has overseen many development projects for local populations. Presidential polls in Tunisia, initially scheduled for November 17, were brought forward in the wake of the death of President Bejik Khayyid Essebzi on July 25th. The legislative elections are now scheduled for October 9th. The election authority announced that all the necessary logistical, legal and human resources will be employed to ensure the success of the poll. CGTN's Adnan Chouachi has more. The Higher Independent Authority for Elections, ESI, has received 1,572 candidate lists in all electoral constituencies at home and abroad. The lists include 687 party lists, 722 independents, and 163 coalition lists. The total number of candidates reached 15,737, vying for 217 seats in the next parliamentary elections. According to the electoral calendar, the ISIE will examine the candidates and will announce the final list on August the 30th. The election authority shed light on the new calendar and briefed political parties about the constitutional and legal constraints that led the election body to announce the upcoming presidential elections for September 15, following the death of President Beji Qaida Sipsi. September the 15th, 2019 is the closest possible date for the organization of early presidential elections. The current calendar will complete the electoral process after 88 days of the start of the provisional presidential term. Many parties and presidential candidates have criticized the calendar. They want to ensure that candidates have the time needed to prepare their applications and collect signatures. Shorter time frames were proposed, particularly in relation to the electoral campaign period which was shortened from 22 to 13 days. The electoral authority has respected the constitution but neglected the political side, which is necessary for the success of the elections. The election authorities timetable for the presidential and legislative elections need to take legal backing and approval from parliament. If the parliament agrees, then we have no problem. Tunisia's election authority is empowered to set, publish and implement the election timetable in accordance with the time frames set forth in the 2014 constitution and the election law. In 2014, the Higher Independent Authority for Elections is he organized the first successful legislative and presidential elections in the history of Tunisia. They were described by local and international observers 
as free, fair and independent. Authorities are confident that EASY can organize successful and transparent elections this year. Adnan Shawishi, CGTN, Tunis. Senior officials from the United Nations made a two-day visit to Hargeisa, the capital of the self-declared but internationally unrecognized Republic of Somaliland. During the trip, UN envoy to Somaliland, James Swan, met with the local leaders and discussed UN collaboration on humanitarian and economic development for local governance and service delivery. This was the UN envoy's first visit since assuming his post in late June. The United Nations top official in Somalia highlighted the importance of building on Somaliland's achievements as well as preparing for upcoming elections there. We also discussed the importance of completing the necessary preparatory work to proceed to credible parliamentary and local elections very soon. And in this context, I'm very pleased to have noted the agreement reached among political parties just yesterday to move forward uh, in preparing for elections on an early timeline. While in Hargeisa, the UN envoy so fast hand some of the work being carried out locally by the world body to address humanitarian needs and longer-term development goals. This included visiting livelihood projects backed by the UNHCR. It was inspirational to see the practical training being provided to equip refugees and asylum seekers to support themselves and their families and also co to contribute to the host economy. He also met local women leaders and administrators of Somaliland Civil Service Institute. During the meeting, Swan reiterated the world's body's commitment to supporting Somaliland's development agenda. Beryl Oro, CGTN. Nigeria's capital, Abuja, is one of the fastest growing cities in Africa, but there's not enough affordable housing to accommodate its growing population. Workers are increasingly forced to commute for hours every day from outside the city because they've been priced out of the housing market. Our correspondent, Phil Ihaza, has more. Jerome Oche is returning home to his family after another long day at work as a maintenance engineer. It takes him nearly three hours every day to get home to his wife and children in the countryside outside Abuja. He says his work is suffering as a result. I came in the outskirts of the city uh, uh, two years ago because uh, I couldn't afford to pay the rent in the city at then. And still till now I have not been able to gather enough money yet to move to the city. And uh, having uh, my work in the city, going uh, uh, to the city to fix heavy-duty generators from here is a heavy challenge. Nigeria's capital is home to more than 2.8 million people, but there's a housing deficit of 1.7 million homes. At least 170,000 new houses need to be built each year to address the problem. That's according to the National Bureau of Statistics. The government is struggling to achieve that target alone, though, which is why a group of property advisors mounted a recent housing expo in Abuja. You're aware that there's housing deficit in Nigeria, and uh, we don't want to leave this responsibility to the government alone. So we're trying to, you know, bridge that gap. And of course, it's an investment opportunity for us as well. Some property developers are offering a 50% discount on houses valued at over $70,000. But in a country like Nigeria, where the minimum wage is $83 per month, these houses are still out of reach for many people. Even if you want to sell such a house to a civil servant, it's very, it, the, the amount is very huge. The amount you know, cannot be deducted at the period or even the last part of the person. You know, because how much would they be deducted from your salary? How much can you be take home? Experts say the minimum wage of low-income earners will need to increase substantially in order for them to afford a good home in the city. The government has directed banks to make housing more affordable and provide cheaper mortgage plans so low- and middle-income earners can afford to live in the city. Until then, the likes of a chair will have to cope with long commutes and maximizing the little time left with family. Phil Ihaza, CGTN, Abuja, Nigeria. 
And let's now go to Panina Karibe for your latest business news. Thank you, Lindy. And coming up on Africa Life Business. Representatives from China and the U.S. met in Shanghai for the first round of talks since May. And unemployment in South Africa rises to the highest level in 11 years. Africa is the nexus of enterprise and global business will tell you why it matters. From the mega investment projects to multi-billion dollar mergers and acquisitions. Africa today collects just in terms of revenues from taxes alone $545 billion a year. If you take 10% of that and you devote it to the energy sector, problem solved. All this on Global Business, weekdays at this time on CGTN. Business in Africa is at the crossroads, where opportunity meets innovation, where profitable new markets collide with global trends. From the sound of an African bell on a stock market floor, to the shout of the trader in a bustling free market. It's colorful, vibrant and exotic. CGTN stands at the gateway to Europe, Africa and the Middle East. From Morocco to South Africa, we talk to the deal makers and actors who fuel its engines of growth. Only on CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Representatives from China and the U.S. are meeting in Shanghai for the first round of talks since May. The two-day meeting is aimed at implementing the consensus reached by the leaders of the two countries during the sidelines of last month's G20 summit in Japan. The Chinese delegation is headed by Vice Premier Liu He, while the U.S. side has Trade Representative Robert Lighthizer and Secretary of the Treasury Steven Mnuchin. The talks are the latest development in the lingering, tra lingering trade tensions between the world's two largest economies. CGTN Sun Tianyuan talks us through the major events in the past few months leading up to resumed negotiations. If we look back over this year, tensions were at an all-time high in May after the 11th round of China-U.S. trade talks uh, suffered a major setback. The U.S. decided to increase additional tariffs on $200 billion worth of Chinese goods from 10% to 25%. U.S. President Donald Trump also threatened to raise duties on more Chinese imports. Beijing made its stance clear to Washington after that. If you want to talk, the door is open. If you want to fight, we will fight to the end. China also retaliated with extra tariffs on a range of U.S. imports on June 1st. Later that month, uh, President Xi Jinping and President Trump met on the sidelines of the G20 summit in Osaka, Japan, where they agreed to restart trade talks based on mutual respect. It was seen as a diffusing point for the world's two largest economies, and several million tons of U.S. soybeans have been shipped out to China this month. Uh, this is China's first major purchase of U.S. farm products since May. And meanwhile, the U.S. has waived extra duties on 110 types of industrial products from China. Chinese authorities said uh, the latest measures have shown the two sides' readiness to implement the consensus reached by the two presidents. Tensions between the U.S. and China are being felt strongly in many American states. Many governors are saying that damage has already been done in billions of dollars of lost investment and they're quietly defying Trump to try to keep trade with China going. CGTN's Owen Fairclough has more. The U.S. and China are still locked in a trade war and some experts fear it may escalate into something worse. The United States faces the potential for major conflict with China on all fronts, strategy, diplomacy, security, military. Individual states such as Oregon are among the casualties. What is happening nationally has had a chilling effect on commodity prices and our ability to sell goods to China. Um, it's been extremely detrimental, particularly in the agricultural yeah. sector, which is a huge driver of the Oregon economy. Oregon once benefited from record Chinese investments in the U.S., and China remains the number one client for the Port of Portland. But overall, Chinese direct investment in the U.S. has dropped more than 80% since President Trump took office in 2017. 
Missouri's former governor has also witnessed the fallout of the White House pressuring China into changing what it considers harmful trade practices. The tariffs hit our region more than anybody else in terms of agriculture. If individual states can't alter federal trade policy, they are determined to keep their relationship with China alive by investing in cultural and educational exchanges. From my perspective as a governor, it's, it's, um, it's all about the jobs and the economy, right? But um, if I can't impact that and I'm going to do everything I can to impact that side, then I'm going to focus on the relationship piece, the cultural piece, because that's a long-term investment. As China hosts the latest round of trade negotiations with the US, these leaders hope that kind of long-term view will prevail. Owen Fairclough, CGTN. The rate of unemployment in South Africa has jumped to its highest over the last 11 years. The country has recorded a rate of 29% for the second quarter of this year, meaning that nearly three people in every 10 that should be working have no form of employment. The statistics agency attributes the rise to employment losses in private households, transport and mining. The rate of unemployment was pegged at 27.6% in the first three months of this year. Yellow Digital Financial Services Limited, a subsidiary of MTN Nigeria, has secured a license to provide financial services in the country. MTN runs Nigeria's biggest mobile phone network, serving around 56 million people. Yellow Digital secured a full super agent license from the Central Bank of Nigeria that will enable it to hire small businesses to distribute financial services across Nigeria. The move follows Nigeria's decision to open up the banking sector to telecom companies in a bit improve financial inclusion. MTN Group, the parent company of MTN Nigeria, had announced its plans to apply for a mobile banking license in the country. MTN has the largest mobile phone network in Nigeria, serving around 56 million people. The West African nation of Senegal is one of the world's biggest contributors to plastics in the ocean. That's according to a study reported by the journal Science. Now, Senegal's government is set to crack down on polluters with a new law, police interventions and fines. But with the country having failed to enforce a plastic ban, Senegalese remain skeptical about the seriousness of government's efforts to keep the country clean. Sajitian's Tuli Shabalala has that story. For more than 10 years, Senegalese eco-warrior Mado Fal has been fighting to change people's habits of throwing plastic waste out into the streets. Covering himself in used plastic bags, he regularly visits schools and teaches children about the importance of caring for the environment, wildlife and the ocean's ecosystem. So if we go on like this and don't change our behavior, then the fight against climate change will go on. That is what's causing all the problems, all the disasters you see around the world. It is a lack of willingness. People need to know that the state can't do everything, because it is not the authorities that bring all of this waste here. It's the people. It is their place of work. It is their dumping ground. It's here they do just whatever. Environmental group Greenpeace says it is not enough to rely on individuals to keep the environment clean. They want the government to impose a total ban on single-use plastic and packaging. In 2015, government did ban the single use of plastic bags, yet it continues to be an integral part of the urban landscape and ends up in the coastline of Dakar. It's true, we should have enforced the law immediately, given that it was a law that dates back to 2015 and it is applicable. There was a delay when the law was voted, a delay given to importers, a delay given to producers, but also to everyone in the industry, the resellers and so on. But we have deemed necessary to speak to the people, to make them aware of the negative impact of plastic on our environment. Authorities in the country have drafted new laws and are raising awareness on the harmful effects of plastic.
In coming months, police officers will start going to shops and handing out fines of up to $85 to those that are still handing out thin plastic bags. In our zero waste transition, we have to start eliminating all plastic bottles and replace them with glass bottles. You see, look at the beach now, how beautiful it is. But at 1 p.m., 2 p.m., you come back and it looks like a dumping ground because people bring their products in their plastic and they throw it anywhere. Senegal will be joining the ranks of countries like Kenya, Rwanda and Cape Verde that have imposed severe restrictions on the use or manufacturing of single-use plastics. Tuli Shabalala, CGTN. We shall leave it there for now, but later on Global Business, NTN has obtained a license to offer financial services in Nigeria. We look at the possible impact of mobile money in that country. We shall be live from the financial capital, Lagos. That's at the top of the hour. For now, though, it's back to you, Lindy. Thanks, Penina. Well, let's take a short break. Here's what's still ahead on Africa Live. Coming up, a Mozambican artist uses recycled magazines to make glossy artworks. Nigeria is my home. 160 million vibrant, ambitious individuals constantly seeking the perfect self-expression. It is these people who inspired me to be that person that is seen, to be a voice that is heard, and ultimately to be the anchor that I am. I have to tap in, tune in, and turn on the very best qualities within me to deliver the news. I'm Richard Nta, an anchor for CGTN. Africa Live. Find your voice. Mozambican-born artist Dario Manjate, who is currently living in South Africa, indulges art lovers with what he calls his collage art. He makes his artwork from recycled magazines because he says the glossy look and feel of the paper, along with the messages the magazines carry, lends itself to, its, to his overall theme of his artwork. CGTN's Yuli Sanjamela has more. Dario Manjate uses old magazines to create collage. Collage is a certain technique that is utilized using found or recycled objects to create a piece of art. If you can check properly, those, the people who made the magazines, né, they did not intend to have those pieces as an artwork. They wanted to sell their magazines, right? So what I do, I, sele I select uh, randomly the pieces that you see, because today we are bombarded with consumerism. They need also for recycling. Most of the portraits that line the walls of his place portray women in different moods and lights, showing that women do indeed play a great role in his work. Manjata says this is because he's inspired by his grandmother who raised him. And I learned a lot from her, to be honest. So this is the reason why you can see I prefer to choose the queens, like I call them queens, like <laughs> you just said, right? And <clears throat> to create some sort of empowerment, you know, of women as well. His work is sought after for its extraordinary qualities. Dario is proof that indeed one man's trash is another man's treasure. He repurposes magazines to create his fascinating work. I believe in that, yeah, like one, man, one man's junk is another man's treasure, you know. Yeah, because I mean, as you can see, these magazines, they were supposed to be dumped somewhere, you know, and I had to make use of them. Dario Manjate has participated in various community projects such as Work to Win, an environmental awareness project which included several art murals created to uplift his surrounding township community. These particular pieces focused on a topic very close to the artist's heart. They created awareness around the dangers of pollution and global warming. So, as a passionate environmental custodian myself, in this case, I decided to help Dario. I think I do service one last one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
So, and then mm -hmm. you can call it somewhere there. Nazo. And then you get a brush again and on top. On top. Just run it DJ over. Simple, you see? Oh wow, and it feels smooth. Yeah. Like I learned I when I That's the good thing about colour. Oh wow. With spectacular results, of course. Well, if I may say so myself. You listen to Jamela for CGTN in Johannesburg, South Africa. Now, Rwanda currently hosts 174,000 refugees, 57,000 of whom come from Burundi. Among them is Mike Katiaboga, who not only found refuge in the country, but also a place for his art to flourish. With the help of a few friends, he's been able to pursue his passion for art. Mike Katiaboga fled to Rwanda from Burundi in 2015. He moved from a refugee camp to Kigali to pursue making art. There, he found not only a friend, but a collaborator. When I had the opportunity to meet Jamal, we talked and we had a lot in common. We are both young, he said to me. Let us work together and we can do great things. Jamal invited Mike to work together at his art center. Mike also lives at the Kanya Burunga Art Center, which means a little beautiful place. The friends exhibit their works together. Helping people doesn't mean uh, you need something big, very, very big, so you can help people. A small thing you have got, uh, and uh, a good heart you have got, they can be enough to help someone. Jamal's art center is open to artists from Burundi, Rwanda, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Astatal, CGTN. And here's what's coming up in your sports news up next. Esperance and we don't wait for Wednesday's cast ruling. Africa Live. Find your voice. The Confederation of African Football will have to wait for a ruling by the Court of Arbitration for Sport tomorrow before deciding on the next move for the botched Champions League final between Esperance and Widad Casablanca. Moroccan side Widad walked off an hour into the return fixture in Tunis on the 31st of May this year when a VAR malfunction meant their disallowed equaliser could not be reviewed. Both clubs appealed to CAF for a decision, with each claiming they should be handed the victory. Last month, CAF ordered the second leg to be replayed at a neutral venue after the Africa Cup of Nations. Now, Paris Saint-Germain have signed Senegal and Everton midfielder Idrissa Gay for a fee in the region of $36.5 million. The 29-year-old who joined Everton from Aston Villa in 2016 and played 108 times for the Toffees has signed a four-year deal with the French champions. Elsewhere, English Premier League side Arsenal are on the verge of confirming the $86.5 million club record signing of Ivory Coast winger Nicolas Pepe from Lille later this week. The 24-year-old arrived in London for a medical before signing a five-year contract. Burkina Faso have officially presented their new national...